The next message from Yamato was that her last plane and the last one from Yahagi should now be launched to return to Kyushu. But this order was rescinded shortly when two unidentified planes were sighted to the north. Our ship-based scout planes would have no chance against enemy fighters. Uchino grumbled, Why didn't those Zero fighters hang around to fight enemy planes? Kimura answered him calmly, Take it easy, Uchino, hold your temper. You know those youngsters wouldn't have a chance against the seasoned enemy pilots. The clouds lowered, the weather grew worse, and at 8am it started to drizzle. Our ring formation of ten ships advanced steadily toward their doom, observed constantly by enemy scout planes. At the same time Japanese planes calmly winged their way on a training mission, I had seen many kinds of operations, but never one like this. It was weird, at 9am destroyer Asashimo, right of Yahagi, slowed down. Through binoculars I could almost make out the face of my old friend Sugihara on her bridge, where there was a flurry of excitement. Her signal flags announced engine trouble, greatly disturbed to see her fall behind, leaving a breach in the ring formation. I sent a message requesting further information. Asashimo replied, rushing repairs, hope to rejoin soon, but she fell farther behind, and by 10am was completely out of sight. Kamura ordered Kasumi to move up into the vacancy, and the next four destroyers shifted their positions accordingly. This adjustment was no mean feat while the formation continued its zigzag course. It had meant a lot to me to know that my old friend Sugihara was supporting my right flank. It was dismaying to realise that this place was now occupied by the second smallest ship of our force. Our radios presently began to pick up enemy messages again, this time transmitted from aircraft near at hand. It was clear that our faint course had served no purpose, the enemy was aware of our force. A pleasant matter was the appearance of three 2,000-ton freighters to port. They presented a cheery aspect as they saluted us. Someone remarked that he didn't realise we still had transports of this size. At 11.30am, a seaplane was detected 20,000 metres to the east. It approached to within a safe distance and circled leisurely about our formation, giving detailed reports of our movements. What a pity we did not have fighters available to shoot down this threat to our safety. While we watched wistfully, this plane cruised beyond the range of our anti-aircraft guns. The radio suddenly boomed. A Mamiyoshima lookout station reports 250 enemy planes heading northward. Here they come, said Kimura with a wry smile. A Mamiyoshima is an island midway between Kyushu and Okinawa. Without even looking at a chart, every bridge officer knew that these enemy planes would be overhead within an hour. Yamato ordered distance between ships increased to 5,000 metres, a standard procedure against air attack. Yahagi and the seven destroyers poured on fuel, and gun crews readied their weapons. Yahagi's six big 150mm guns, four 80mm anti-aircraft guns, and 40 machine guns pointed rapidly skyward. Ammunition supplies at hand, the gunners stood alert at their positions. When noon came and there was no sign of an attack, orderlies brought lunch to the combat posts. Everyone ate hurriedly, washing down the food with steaming green tea, I watched the efficient preparations with great satisfaction. My uneasiness vanished, and I knew that Yahagi would give a good account of herself. At 12.20pm, Yamato signalled her radar findings. Large group of planes distant 30,000 metres, bearing 35 degrees to port. All ships, full speed ahead, prepare for anti-aircraft action. The orders were hardly necessary. All ships were making nearly 30 knots, with Kimura and other officers, I climbed to Yahagi's anti-aircraft command post behind the bridge. Yamato raised huge bow waves as she pushed through the water at her maximum speed. The 72,000-ton battleship presented a striking inspiration to every man in the force. Navy men had an almost religious faith in Yamato. This feeling was heightened when she returned intact from the Leyte battle, even though sister ship Musashi was sunk there. Rear Admiral Nobue Morishita was on board as Ito's chief of staff. He had been in command of Yamato at Leyte, and I thought would surely bring her good luck again. Who could imagine that this greatest battleship ever built would be sunk within two hours? Even from the command post we still could not see any planes approaching. The cloud cover had descended to 1,500 metres, 
and a sudden rain squall blurred out everything around us. The situation couldn't have been worse, and now the planes must be overhead, above the clouds. Though Yahagi had practiced firing control with her new radar, it worked only against surface targets. Her sets were useless against planes. I realised woefully that our manually operated guns would not even have time to aim once enemy planes popped out of the low clouds. A lookout shouted, Two planes on part bow. I looked up to see not two, but twenty, forty, and more planes spilling out of the thick clouds. It was 12.32pm when I ordered, Open fire. I had expected the planes to swoop down at us immediately. Instead, they began circling clockwise, just below the clouds. Then I saw that one of the three groups was circling counterclockwise. This strange activity was completely baffling. Gun crews fumbled trying to set ranges, and then they seemed too bewildered to fire. The confident enemy was methodically sizing up his victims while they circled. The flight commanders must have been assigning planes to specific targets. There was brief sporadic fire from a few of our ships when all the planes first came into view and started their merry-go-round. Yamato's 918.1-inch guns roared off a few rounds of Type 3 shells which scattered in the sky, but even these fell miserably short of the intended goals. Suddenly the planes whirled and came thundering down toward their selected targets. Many ships' guns were still swinging into position. The first planes to pick on Yahagi were four Avenger TBM bombers. Our cruiser rattled and roared, firing with all guns, but with little aim, as the bombs came curving down towards our port side. I called for hard right rudder and Yahagi responded beautifully, the bombs dropped from about 500 metres, raised water pillars all about, but none hit. The next group, Hellcat F6F fighters, dove defiantly lower. I could see the face of one pilot who jerked his stubby plane upward scarcely 10 metres in front of me. The deadly whine and thud of machine gun bullets beat like hail through the length of the ship, but none hit my men. The gun crews stuck to their posts and fired steadily, but they also failed to score. I looked hastily about to see all ships dashing at full speed, kicking up white waves and shooting with everything they had. In the water I caught sight of the weird crossing of foamy lines which spelled aerial torpedoes. Right rudder, full speed, I shouted, as another dozen planes came at us. Black bombs sent white spray towering a hundred metres into the air. Fighters came careering down, fanning us with bullets and prop wash as they pulled out at masthead level. Yahagi's guns returned a curtain of steel, still neither side scored. A lookout shrieked, more bombers coming, hard right rudder I thundered, and the 8,500-ton ship jerked and wheeled in response, staggering a moment in her violent turn. Our guns missed again, but so did the enemy planes. Yahagi's fourth group of attackers was coming in when the radio room reported that Asashimo was under attack. No time to think of that lone crippled ship as I streamed out orders to keep us from being hit. We wove through that rain of bombs and bullets, again without getting hurt. But what about Asashimo? With her engine trouble, Sugihara would have little chance to oppose an attack. It was fantastic that the enemy could be striking our main force so heavily, and still have planes free to spring on a straggler more than twenty miles away. Yamato was ploughing ahead at full speed, Destroyers were corkscrewing violently here and there, appearing and vanishing in tremendous waves punctuated by mushrooming bursts from bomb hits, misses and near misses. The spectacle was at once thrilling and terrifying. More planes swinging low over Yahagi brought me sharply to action as near misses jolted the ship, but we were still uninjured. It gave me a feeling of relief to realise that our sharp twists and turns were effective in dodging the enemy's attack. If that was an unguarded moment, it was my undoing. A scream from port side, torpedoes, I shouted helm orders, looked down, and in the same moment let out a gasp. Three torpedo wakes were streaking toward us from only a few hundred yards away. The launching Avengers whizzed past the deck, zoomed and thundered triumphantly away. This time I did not follow the planes, but looked steadily at the eerie lines of approaching foam. Yahagi again staggered for a moment in the midst of her violent turn, then shuddered as a torpedo caught her port side, a midship just below the waterline. It is hard for me to believe to this day the occurrence of the next event. Yahagi stumbled crazily for a few minutes, and then shuddered to an abrupt and horrifying halt. 
It was inconceivable that a speeding warship of her size could be brought so suddenly dead in the water by just one torpedo. My stupefaction was increased, if possible, when I looked unbelievingly at my watch to find that it was 12.46pm. We had been fighting for only 12 minutes. I grabbed the engine room voice tube and called for a damage report. No response. I tried the phone with the same result. Then came the realisation that the torpedo had hit the engine room, and I groaned. But the enemy allowed no time for lament. Another six planes swooped down to release bombs. I saw one hit and explode on the forecastle, felling at least a dozen men and blowing six bodies into the air. A detonation astern rocked Yahagi and caused a violent tremor throughout her length. Biting my lip in agony, I saw again the sinking Tokyo Maru, victim of a single torpedo hit in the engine room. In the same instant I thought of Britain's mighty repulse and Prince of Wales, sunk by a force far smaller than the one that now confronted us. Suddenly my bolstered confidence was shattered. An orderly came panting to the command post and reported, The torpedo exploded in the centre of the engine room, killing everyone there. The compartments are flooding. What about the watertight bulkheads? The damage control crews are working, sir. The ship was listing noticeably to starboard, I heard Kimura say. Hamakaze's done for. Looking to port where Kimura was staring, I caught sight of the ship's red-painted belly as it sank beneath the waves. A new attack came before our wounded had even received first aid. Uchino ran down the ladder, shouting orders to the gun crews. That was the last I ever saw of my worthy executive. All operable guns opened fire, and for the first time in this action, I saw Yahagi strike back effectively as two planes were knocked down. The ship itself, dead in the water, absorbed many bullets and bombs as group after group of enemy planes came driving in. A dozen to starboard winged low directly into the gunfire barrage. The enemy pilots certainly had guts. The stalled cruiser rocked violently again with a tremendous explosion in the stern. I looked back and saw three mangled bodies hurled sixty feet in the air, and another torpedo exploded in the starboard bow. Yahagi quivered and rocked as though made of paper. Clinging to the rail of the trembling command post, I saw that the torpedo hit had blasted a huge hole in the bow, and the ship's list was increasing. Still another group of fighters and bombers came to concentrate on that shattered bow. The deafening drum of machine-gun bullets was climaxed by a direct bomb hit on number one turret, which wiped out its entire crew and smashed men on the forecastle. Strangely, no one on the bridge or in the command post was hit, but rivets popped as steel plates worked loose and the bridge shook so violently that it might collapse at any moment. The structure of number one turret was still intact, but the force of the 250-pound bomb explosion had cracked the thick steel of the surrounding deck. Yellow, acrid smoke drifted slowly up through the cleavages. Amid all that devastation, I was surprised to hear the voice of the gunnery officer, Lieutenant Hatter, shouting from his post to open the watercocks in number one magazine. For a wonder the valves still worked, and the inrushing water quenched the fires in that magazine as Hatter had figured. With fires out, the yellow smoke stopped. Had that magazine exploded, the ship would have sunk quickly with no chance of survivors. But of course, the flooding magazine accelerated the listing of the ship. Still, the planes kept attacking, and the next group hit with more bombs than I was able to count. When the explosions ended, I shuddered to find that several gun posts and crews had vanished. How long can one endure the horror of his men being torn to shreds, and still there were no hits on the main bridge and command post? I was jolted back to my duties when the torpedo room voice tube squawked my name. It was Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Kamiyama requesting permission to empty the torpedo tubes. He said, If they are set off it will blast everything. OK, dump the fish, I shouted. Almost at once, sixteen powerful homing torpedoes slithered unarmed into the water. I thought wistfully of what damage might have been done to enemy ships by these deadly weapons we now had to waste. It was another last-minute reminder of our doom. Kamiyama acted not a moment too soon. The last torpedo was barely in the water when bombs blasted the tubes and rooted out Yahagi's stern mast. Looking aft from the command post, still miraculously intact, I saw that the catapult was a shambles. The ruins of twisted iron looked like melting candy bars. The lone airplane untouched just a minute ago was a mass of cinders. 
A few guns barked as their burned and blood-soaked crews still manned their posts. Avengers came in skimming over the waves and dropped torpedoes. Three, four. I could not tell how many found their target. Our dying ship quaked with the detonations. The explosions finally stopped, but the list continued as waves washed blood pools from the deck and dismembered bodies fell rolling into the sea. And now the second wave of some hundred planes had done their work and gone. I looked around. All gun posts lay in ruins. My proud cruiser was but a mass of junk, barely afloat. Strangely, I thought, there are no fires. Through this weird sight, my dazed brain raced back to see Cruiser San Francisco, the phantom-like ship my Amatsukaze almost crashed into that pitch-dark night off Santa Cruz. Now Yahagi too was a phantom ship. Nothing stirred on her main deck. Many of her crew had perished. On the bridge, not a man had even been injured. Hara, said Admiral Kimura, I guess we better get out of here. It looks like now or never. The 250 planes reported by Amami Oshima seem to have done their job. There was nothing for me to say. I bowed and mumbled, I'm very sorry, Admiral. Let us shift my flag to one of the destroyers and force through to our goal at Okinawa. What do you think? What could I say? I was limp with the burden of responsibility at having lost my ship and crew. Look, Hara, Isakazi is still operating. It was astonishing to find her to port in her original position of the ring formation, about 3,000 yards away. She appeared in good shape and was coming in our direction. It was one of the few heartening moments of the action. All right, Admiral, let's abandon ship, signalman. Raise Isokazi, urgent. At my command, the powerful signal light began blinking, and a signalman also went to work with a pair of hand flags. Word went through Yahagi to prepare to abandon ship, and survivors were made ready for evacuation. Isakazi responded to our signal and kicked up high waves as she raced to the shattered hulk of our cruiser Yahagi. The destroyer slowed down thousand metres away for a cautious approach and drew slowly closer. I ordered abandon ship, enemy planes, a lookout cried, and one minute later the third wave of fighters and bombers was overhead. Isakazi had approached to within about 200 yards, Scores of planes broke off from attacking Yamato to head for the hapless, slow-moving destroyer. Her engines roared into full power as she frantically took evasive measures, but the planes were everywhere, spewing their torrents of bullets and bombs. Explosion followed explosion until Isokaze disappeared in a billow of black smoke. Yahagi had doomed her own destroyer. It was what had almost happened to my Shigure when Sendai was under murderous attack at Empress Augusta Bay, but I had refused to take Shigure into that slaughter. Now I hoped that Isakazi would ignore my request and escape. When it appeared that the destroyer was done for, the planes came to work over what was left of Yahagi. Our floating junk pile was raked and combed by machine gun bullets. Yahagi twisted, rivets popped, plates buckled, and I clung to the bridge rail in desperation. As Yahagi's convulsions subsided, I raised my head and was surprised to see Isokaze emerge from the dissipating wall of smoke and water which had surrounded her. Injured but still alive, she was speeding frantically away. Again scores of planes swooped over Isokaze, which was again lost in a cloud of smoke. After swinging past Isokaze, each plane felt obliged to pay its aggressive respects to our sinking ship. We could do nothing but hang on. The missiles of the enemy were no more frightening than the trembling of our ship in its final throes. Lieutenant Yukio Matsuda, a navigation officer, had rounded up a dozen wounded men and was trying to get them into a lifeboat. This activity drew the attention of three more fighters who concentrated their fire, smashing the boat to bits and dropping the unlucky thirteen dead in pools of their own blood. Elsewhere, men were jumping from the ship into the water. The enemy allowed no time for breath. A fourth wave of about hundred planes arrived to pound and batter everything that still moved. Kimura, a few other officers and I remained unscathed in the command post, which still stood miraculously intact on the crumbling debris of what had been light cruiser Yahagi. Looking out to sea, I knew that Isokazi was in trouble. Her speed had fallen off, and though not on fire, she staggered like a drunk. Suzutsuki, farther off, was afire, and pouring out billows of thick black smoke, Kasumi limped helplessly out of control, her flag signalling rudder trouble. Yamato still appeared to be in good shape, 
At a distance of three miles, I had no way of knowing that this pride of the navy was as badly off as Yahagi. Destroyers Yukikaze and Fuyutsuki flitted nimbly about in a valiant effort to protect the huge ship. The fifth wave of more than one hundred planes showed no mercy to Yahagi in her final agonies. Bullets hissed and whined all about me, not caring now, completely dazed. I gritted my teeth and mumbled, All right, you Yankee devils, finish us off. The whine of a bullet and a sudden sting made me think I was done for. But in knocking me down it roused me from a daze. I examined and dismissed as negligible a wound on my left arm, and then noticed that waves were lapping the deck of the command post, where Admiral Kimura and I now stood alone. Well, Hara, shall we go? he asked calmly. Let's go, while we were removing our shoes. I noted the time, 2.6pm. Planes roared overhead. Waves were up to our knees when we jumped into the water. I swam only a few metres when some gigantic invisible force dragged me under. I resisted and struggled, but the sucking whirlpool of a sinking ship is irresistible. I gave up and passed out, accepting death. My next awareness was of being released from a vice-like hold. I was kicking and writhing. Around me was complete darkness, but it was thinning. Fuzzily, I admired a mass of bluish beads as they drifted up in front of my face. These were bubbles of air from my clothing and my lungs. Pain of suffocation forced me to swallow a huge gulp of seawater, and then my head broke the surface. I breathed deeply again and again in a great void in which there was no sound, no light, no feeling, no anything. Dazed, not knowing what I was doing, I managed to stay afloat. Gradually, my eyes began to focus, and I was aware of daylight. A buzzing sound turned into voices, and looking around, I saw heads floating on the water. They were all black. In my stupor, I felt it must be a negro bathing beach where I was enjoying a pleasant swim. My brain revived, but slowly I was still dazed. The fatigue and tension of two hours of battle, followed by tremendous shock and collapse, were too much. Then I heard someone shout, Hara! Are you all right, Hara? Do you hear me? I peered in the direction of the voice, saw a black-faced man shouting at me, and recognised Admiral Kimura. His wind and sun-tanned face was so dark that he was recognisable at a distance of thirty feet, even though heavily covered with black oil. I'm all right, Kimura, I answered. How about you? Yes, I'm quite all right, so the Negroes around me were my own men. I patted my face and found my palm covered with heavy oil. The surface of the water was covered with this oil from Yahagi. To my surprise, there were many men clinging to bits and pieces of wood. I thought that the crew had all perished. As my vision returned, I caught a glimpse of Yamato, still big and impressive, even at a distance of six miles. Rolling waves occasionally hid her, but when a crest raised me high, I could see scores of planes swarming about her like gnats. While I floated, wondering what would happen, a log drifted by within my grasp. I clutched at it, grabbed and clung to it tenaciously. With my security thus improved, I considered what my next move should be. Hey you! Move over! Make room for me! shouted someone behind me. A young man was trying to reach the log. I moved slowly to one end to permit him a handhold. He caught the log and looked at me gratefully. Who are you? What's your name? he asked as soon as he caught his breath. My name is Hara, I'm from Yahagi. My new neighbour gasped and was suddenly speechless. He stared at me for some moments as though in a trance. I'm very sorry, sir, he mumbled. Forgive my rudeness, I am second-class seaman Daiwa. I'd better find another log, Captain Hara. This one isn't big enough to support both of us. He looked around uneasily and I said, Don't be foolish, son. Hang on tight, we can manage. Are you hurt? No, sir, not at all. My friend Asamo and I decided to die quickly when Yahagi was doomed. We went to Number 3 magazine and mounted the shells, waiting to be blown to bits. But Petty Officer Yamada came and ordered us up on deck, he said. This is my place. He was so furious that we raced up the ladder. I stumbled once and sprained my ankle, but that is nothing. I wonder what happened to Hanada and my buddy Asamo. Don't worry, Daiwa. Now think only of survival. You will get out of this if you don't give up. We looked around and saw Yamato still moving. What a beautiful sight. Suddenly smoke belched from her waterline. We both groaned as white smoke billowed out until it covered the great battleship, giving her the appearance of a snow-capped Mount Fuji. 
Next came black smoke mingled with the white, forming into a huge cloud which climbed to 2,000 metres. As it drifted away, we looked to the surface of the sea again, and there was nothing. Yamato had vanished. Tremendous detonations at 2.23pm of that seventh day of April signalled the end of this unsinkable symbol of the Imperial Navy. I felt a sudden chill and realised for the first time that it was raining. As I thought of Yamato, my tears mingled with the rain and the water of the sea. After the war, my friend Rear Admiral Nobue Morishita, one of Yamato's 269 survivors, told me the details of her last minutes. The fast direct hit on Yamato was by bombs at 12.40pm, and the first torpedo struck the ship to port ten minutes later. In all, eight more torpedoes hit on the port side and two hit to starboard. Captain Jiro Nomura, Yamato's executive, determined at 2.5pm that the ship's trim could not be restored. Thereupon, Vice Admiral Ito, who had been on the bridge throughout the battle, cancelled the operation and ordered abandon ship. Destroyer Fuyutsuki was called in to assist the evacuation, but it was impossible to approach the rapidly sinking behemoth. Commander Hidachika Sakuma, skipper of Fuyutsuki, kept clear because he figured that his small ship would be dragged down as the big one sank. Ito shook hands with the officers on the bridge and then withdrew to his cabin to die with the ship. Yamato's skipper, Rear Admiral Kosaku Aruga, tied himself to the bridge binnacle to ensure going down with Yamato. Morishita had to argue violently with the other officers who wanted to share the fate of Ito, Aruga and Yamato, but he convinced them and they all left the bridge together. The ship's port list was increasing rapidly when the last torpedo hit at 2.17pm. Three minutes later the list had reached 20 degrees, inducing explosions which sent the ship into a precipitous plunge. These same explosions saved Morishita and others, throwing them clear of the ship. Clinging to the log, I was lost in gloomy thoughts for several minutes after Yamato's sinking. I grieved at the loss of my cruiser, and I grieved doubly at loss of the world's greatest battleship. Looking about, I could see no sign of Kimura, and young Daiwa was no longer clinging to the other end of the log. There was no one in sight. I seemed to be riding a current which had carried me away from the others. Was I to die like this, alone? Then I heard voices singing not too far away. I thought of our survival instruction that men adrift in the ocean should stay quiet to conserve physical strength and not exhaust themselves with singing and shouting. Since these men were singing, they had probably decided that there was no chance of rescue and they might just as well give their spirits whatever lift might be derived from song. The sound grew stronger as more voices joined. I heard it distinctly and recognised the song of the warrior, familiar to Japanese fighting men for hundreds of years. If I go to sea, I shall return a corpse awash. If duty calls me to the mountain, a verdant sward will be my pall. Thus, for the sake of the emperor, I shall not die peacefully at home. As the song was repeated, I found myself joining in. From time to time there were hoarse shouts of Tenoheika, Banzai, Long Live the Emperor, which suggested that the exhausted or seriously wounded singers were dropping out of the chorus to their death. I closed my eyes and the song grew faint in my ears. I knew that I was going to die. The distant melody, wavering like a lullaby, brought back my childhood and my mother's songs, my grandfather, school days, the academy, our world cruise, shopping in a New York department store, young officer days, my affair with the geisha girl. This kaleidoscope changed into a vivid picture of my mother, overlapped by one of my wife, and then my last formal officer portrait, which was replaced by the faces of my children. I came out of this weird reverie with tears streaming down my cheeks. Thinking of my last home leave just four months ago, and the children and my wife, I realised that they would face many hardships after my death. I cried aloud for their forgiveness and hoped they would try to understand. It was selfish of me to have married Chizu, taking her away from the comfortable life she had known. Now I was leaving her widowed, with three children. Forgive me, Chizu. The singing had stopped. The water and the air seemed colder. I shuddered, chilled to the bone. My hands were going numb and I was having trouble keeping my grip. Something drifted by and I picked it up. Nothing but a piece of black paper. I started to throw it away, but instead shoved it in my raincoat pocket. 
Then I felt something else and pulled it out. It was a four-feet piece of rope. I had no idea of how it got there. But this rope changed my entire outlook. I tied myself so that even if I passed out, the log would still keep me afloat, and there was always the chance that my body would wash ashore on the coast of Japan. Planes were overhead again, probably the last attack wave, but in my increasing torpor they were a matter of indifference, until several fighters began to spray the sea with machine gun bullets. They concentrated on the large group of survivors, still separated from me, but some bullets came my way too. None hit me, but the whine and swish of bullets awakened me to anger against the pilots. Hating them, I found unrealised strength which let me duck and twist around, and my numbness soon vanished. No more fighters came, but to my astonishment, a Martin PBM flying boat swooped low and landed on the water about 300 metres away. I ducked again, but the Martin paid no attention to me. It taxied slowly to a patch of water dyed brilliantly green, picked up an American pilot who had been drifting in a life raft and took off again. I watched that operation with feelings of envy, the feelings of another Yahagi survivor, Ensign Shigeo Yamada, who was also close to the rescue, were quite different. He was born in Hawaii and, being proficient in English, served as a communication officer. He later told me I was afraid of being taken prisoner because of my background and hastily tore all insignia of rank from my uniform and threw them away. But the flying boat and her crew did not come near me. Yamada survived the war and in 1958 was working in the Japan Airlines offices in Chicago, Illinois, a prospect not readily envisaged that April day of 1945. The area was all quiet again. I felt easy for the first time and began to reflect coolly on the day's actions. My anti-aircraft manoeuvring had been clumsy. In a destroyer I would have pulled through without any doubt. So my true calibre was that of a destroyer skipper nothing more, but that was wrong. I blundered in forgetting the solution used successfully off Kavieng when Shigure had bagged the two bombers. Yahagi was much faster and more agile than Shigure. Why had I kept the cruiser in the outmoded zigzag pattern which let the torpedo catch us? Yes, I had blundered, but I was rusty after a year ashore. If only the high command had kept me at sea instead of diverting me to that useless and ineffective shore assignment. All our practice and training with homing torpedoes, proximity fuses and radar-controlled gunfire had been of no use in this day's action against hundreds of planes. Everything we did seemed to be wrong. This very operation itself, without aerial protection of any kind for the ships, was a grotesque mistake. I had no idea of how many hours had passed since Yahagi's sinking. It was dark and the wind was rising. I shuddered with cold and began to get drowsy. I fought against sleep, knowing that with sleep would come an end to my cares. But after all, a samurai lives so that he is always prepared to die. I could wait quietly for death without regret or remorse. Around me I saw nothing but rising waves and heard nothing but the sound of the water slapping against my log. I closed my eyes and slept. With my head resting against the wood, I dreamed of days gone by. I was crossing from Shikoku to Honshu for the first time to apply for the academy entrance exams. The engine of the ferryboat had a distinctive sound and I could hear it clearly again. It did not seem like a dream. I opened my eyes and the sound continued. I saw a destroyer a mile away and thought it must still be fighting off the persistent planes. My head sank down again on the log, but the engine noise kept me from dozing. It sounded too close to be the destroyer. I looked up and saw a motorboat. This small craft, the kind normally carried by a destroyer, was not more than 200 metres away and readily visible between wave crests. I wondered what it was doing here. The boat disappeared. I craned my neck for another sight of it. After some minutes it emerged again, this time only fifty metres away. The boat was circling, looking for survivors. Suddenly I was terrified. I wanted desperately to live and was afraid they might miss me. I yelled at the top of my lungs, but the boat completed its circle without noticing me. In desperation I untied myself from the log and thrashed the water with my arms and legs. That did it. They noticed the splashing and turned in my direction. It seemed an eternity before they reached me. I was too weak even to grab the side of the boat, but four strong hands quickly hauled me in. It was curious, but as soon as my feet were in the dry boat, my exhaustion vanished. 
I stammered gratitude to my rescuers and was surprised to see that there were no other survivors in the boat. The crew chief explained that they had already brought many survivors to the destroyer, and this was their last trip. They searched for another 15 minutes without further success and headed back to destroyer Hatsushimo. My surge of energy gave out when I tried to climb the ladder. My feet simply would not move. Two husky sailors boosted me to the destroyer deck. Hatsushimo's skipper, Commander Masazo Sako, greeted me. Welcome home, Captain Hara. We had almost despaired of finding you. Admiral Kimura is resting in my cabin. I mumbled my thanks to Sako and was grateful that darkness hid my face, which must have reflected how badly I felt. Sako took me to the sick bay where my water and oil-soaked clothes were removed. Skilled corpsmen gave me first aid and a massage, which did much to restore me. I thanked them and asked for a glass of sake. The doctor laughed and said, Yes, Captain Hara. Ordinarily I might object, but I am sure that sake is just what you need. The drink revived me quickly, and they next gave me a steaming bowl of soup. While I drank, the medical officer briefed me on events as seen from his ship. I'm afraid that Hatsushimo did not contribute much to this mission. The attackers passed us by to strike at Yamato. As a result, we did not suffer a direct hit of any kind. Two of our sailors were slightly injured, but not a man on board was killed. Hatsushimo is probably the only undamaged ship of our force. That's why we stayed here looking for survivors. Fuyutsuki, Suzutsuki and Yukikaze, all damaged left for Sasebo two hours ago. Fuyutsuki is not in bad shape. She was hit by two rockets, neither of which exploded, but a dozen of her men were killed by machine gun bullets. Yukikaze is not badly damaged, but she lost three men killed by strafing. Suzutsuki was hit by a bomb which knocked off her bows, and she had to return stern first to Sasebo. Isokaze was not so lucky. She suffered no direct hits, but near misses hold her, flooding the engine room and killing 100 of her crew. When there was no hope for her, she was dispatched by Yukikaze, who took survivors. Kasumi was badly disabled and had 17 killed. Her survivors were removed by Fuyutsuki, who then gave her the coup de grace. I thanked him for the information, and had nothing else to ask except, did you rescue a sailor named Daiwa? The medic checked a list and replied, Yes, sir, his name is here, in fact. He has been asking about you ever since he was picked up two hours ago. He called an orderly. Tell Daiwa that Captain Hara is safe. Destroyer Hatsushimo, loaded with hundreds of Yamato and Yahagi survivors, returned to Sasebo at noon on the 8th of April. An orderly knocked at the captain's cabin as soon as we had anchored, and delivered a message to Admiral Kimura. He read it, grimaced, and handed it to me. It was a citation for the Second Fleet from Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, commending our force for its gallant self-sacrifice, which enabled the special attack planes to achieve a great war result. What was this great war result? The air attack effort that day consisted of 114 planes. The 60 fighters, 40 bombers and 14 kamikazes succeeded only in damaging carrier Hancock, battleship Maryland and destroyer Bennett, at a cost of nearly 100 planes. The second fleet had sorted with one battleship, one light cruiser and eight destroyers. It was attacked over a period of two hours by a total of 386 carrier-based planes. Ten of these planes and 12 American lives were lost to anti-aircraft fire from our ships. Of the second fleet, only three destroyers survived. Japanese lives lost in the action came to 2,498 in Yamato, 446 in Yahagi, and 721 in the destroyers. These simple but astounding statistics tell the story of who won and who lost the last aerial surface engagement of the war. The powerful navy which had launched the Pacific War 40 months before with the attack on Pearl Harbor had at last been struck down. On April 7, 1945, with the sinking of battleship Yamato, the Imperial Japanese Navy died. Sinking of PT-109 and rescue of survivors, in anticipation of a Japanese supply effort to Vila on the southwest corner of Kolombangara Island, 14 boats of MTB Flotilla 1 were on patrol in Blackett Strait on Sunday night, August 1, 1943. They had departed from their Rendover base at 6.30pm and arrived at stations two hours later. P-109 
PT-109 Lieutenant Jack Kennedy, USNR, was patrolling Blackett Strait about 2.30am at idling, using only one of her three engines, when a dark shape loomed up on her starboard bow at a distance of no more than 300 yards. At first, this shape was taken for another PT boat, but it was soon identified as a Hibiki-type destroyer of the Fubuki class, and bearing down on PT-109 at high speed. The torpedo boat started a starboard turn preparatory to firing torpedoes, but had swung through no more than 30 degrees when the destroyer struck forward of the forward starboard torpedo tube and sheared off the starboard side of the boat aft, including the starboard engine. Scarcely 10 seconds elapsed between time of sighting and the crash. The destroyer neither slowed nor fired as she split the PT. A surface gasoline fire ignited immediately about 20 yards from the remains of the boat which were still afloat. Lieutenant Kennedy ordered abandon ship as it appeared that the fire was approaching. When this danger passed, they crawled back on board except for three men hundred yards to the southwest, two to the northeast, and two who did not respond to shouts and proved to be missing. Kennedy swam toward the group of Harris, McMahon and Starkey, while Ensign's Leonard J. Tom and George H. R. Ross struck out for Zinsa and Johnson. McMahon was helpless because of serious burns, and Kennedy had to tow him back to the boat, which took an hour because a strong current impeded their progress. Kennedy then returned for the other two men. He traded his life belt for Harris's useless waterlogged life jacket, and together they towed injured Starkey back to the PT. Meanwhile, Tom and Ross had reached Zinsa and Johnson, who were both helpless because of gasoline fumes and towed them. Both men regained consciousness by the time they got to the boat. Within three hours after the crash, all survivors who could be located were on board PT-109. Marnie and Kirksey were never seen after the crash. During the three hours it took to gather survivors, nothing was seen or heard to indicate other ships in the area. No very pistols were fired for fear of giving away their position to the enemy, all classified gear and publications on board were sunk in the deep waters of Vela Gulf. When daylight of August 2nd arrived, the 11 survivors were still on board. It was estimated that the boat then lay about four miles north and slightly east of Gizo Anchorage, and about three miles from the reef along the northeast side of Gizo Island. Despite the fact that all watertight doors were dogged down at the time of the crash, PT-109 was slowly taking on water. It was obvious that the boat would sink on the second, so it was decided to abandon it in time to reach one of the tiny islands east of Gizo before dark. A small island four miles southeast of Gizo was chosen rather than a closer one, which it was feared might be occupied by Japanese. At 2pm, Lieutenant Kennedy took the badly burned McMahon in tow and set out for land, intending to lead the way and scout the island in advance of the others. Ensigns Ross and Tom followed with the other men. Johnson and Mauer, who could not swim, were tied to a float which was part of the 37mm gun mount. Harris and Maguire were fair swimmers, but Zinsa, Starkey and Albert were not so good. The strong swimmers pushed or towed the float to which the non-swimmers were tied. The men had shed most of their clothes. Ensign Tom was the only one who still wore shoes. By way of arms, the group had 645 S2 of which were lost before their rescue, 138, one large knife, one light knife, and a pocket knife. They had one flashlight, but the first aid kit was lost in the collision. All of the group, with the exception of McMahon, who suffered greatly from burns, were in fairly good condition, although weak and tired from their swim ashore. That evening, Lieutenant Kennedy decided to swim into Ferguson Passage, in an attempt to intercept PT boats proceeding to their patrol areas. He left about 6.30pm, swam to a small island half-mile to the southeast, proceeded along a reef which stretched out into Ferguson Passage, arriving there about 8pm. He saw no PTs, but did observe aircraft flares which indicated that the boats were operating that night in Gizo instead of Blackett Strait, and being harassed as usual by enemy float planes. Kennedy began his return over the same route, but was caught in a current which swept him in a two-mile circle into Blackett Strait and back to the middle of Ferguson Passage, where he had to start his homeward trip all over again. He stopped on the small island just southeast of home, where he slept until dawn, before covering the last mile to join the rest of his group. On his return to the group, 
He was completely exhausted, slightly feverish, and slept most of the day. Nothing was seen on August 2nd or 3 that gave any hope of rescue. On the night of the 3rd, Ensign Ross swam into Ferguson Passage in another attempt to intercept PT patrols from Rendover, without success. The total diet of the group, on what they called Bird Island because of its abundance of droppings from the feathered creatures, consisted of coconuts as long as they lasted. When the supply ran low and in order to get closer to Ferguson Passage, the group left Bird Island at noon of August 4th and, using the same arrangements as before, headed for an islet west of Cross Island. Kennedy, with McMahon in tow, arrived first. The rest of the group again experienced difficulty with a strong easterly current, but finally made the eastern tip of the island. Their new abode was slightly larger, offered brush for concealment and a few coconuts, and had no Japanese tenants. The night of August 4th was wet and cold, and no one ventured into Ferguson Passage. The next morning, Kennedy and Ross swam to Cross Island in search of some help for the party. Before they left, a New Zealand P-40 was seen making a strafing run on that island, indicating the possible presence of the enemy. But so acute was their food shortage that the two men set out, swam the channel, and arrived on the island about 3.30pm. They sneaked through the brush to the east side of the island and surveyed the beach, they spied a small rectangular box with Japanese writing on the side and furtively pulled it into the bush. It contained several dozen bags of candy and crackers. A little farther up the beach, they found a one-man canoe and a barrel of water alongside a native lean-to. At the same time, they sighted two natives in a canoe, who, despite all efforts by Kennedy and Ross to attract their attention, paddled swiftly off to the northwest. Nevertheless, having obtained a canoe, food and water, Kennedy and Ross considered their visit a success. That night, Kennedy took the canoe to venture again into Ferguson Passage. When no PTs had appeared by 9pm, he returned home by way of Cross Island, where he picked up the food, but left Ross, who had decided to swim back the following morning. When Kennedy returned about 11.30pm, he found that the two natives he had sighted near Cross Island had circled around and landed on his home island. Ensign Tom finally convinced them that he and his colleagues were Americans, and they then landed and performed every possible service for the survivors. The natives were sent with messages to friendly coast watchers, informing that the crew of PT-109 was on Cross Island. After the natives left, Ross and Kennedy remained on the island until evening when they set out in the two-man canoe to again try their luck at intercepting PTs in Ferguson Passage. They paddled far, saw nothing, and were caught in a sudden rain squall which capsized the canoe. Swimming to land was difficult and treacherous. The sea swept them against the reef on the south side of Cross Island, and Ross received numerous cuts and bruises, but both managed to make land where they stayed the rest of the night. On Saturday, August 7th, eight natives arrived bringing a message from a coast watcher instructing the senior officer to go with the natives to Wanawana. Kennedy and Ross had the natives paddle them to the island where the rest of the survivors were, and all were made as comfortable as possible. That afternoon, Kennedy, hidden under ferns in the native boat, was taken to the coast watcher, arriving about 4pm. There it was arranged that PT boats would rendezvous with him in Ferguson Passage that evening at 10.30pm. Accordingly, he was taken to the rendezvous point, finally made contact with the PTs at 11.15pm and directed the boats to the rest of the survivors. Their rescue was effected without mishap and they returned to the base at Rendover at 5.30am on August 8th, seven days after the ramming of PT-109 in Blackett Strait.